Hey, good morning, everybody. Peggy Berryhill here with you this Tuesday morning, and we have our wonderful friends Scott and Tree are now back on this. Go, Scott and Tree Mercer of Mendonoma Whale and Seal Study are here, and uh, I'm here more or less. Let's get everything going here and. KGUA in Wallala, and today we're very excited to talk to you about the upcoming, just one week away, the Ocean Life Symposium, which has been pulled together by Scott and Tree and our staff here at KGUA. Uh, we will be broadcasting it Monday through Friday next week from 9 a.m. until noon Pacific time. And it will also be on, help if I turn on your mic. <laughs> It'll also be. Or is she a screen too? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we can share a screen if you want to hold your screen up. Could you pull, move yourself over a little bit more forward so you're also in the screen here? So. Literally share a screen. Okay. Okay, there you go. We sort of see you. But anyway, yeah. so um, <laughs> it will also be live streamed, just like we're live streaming now on YouTube. But there will be, I think, about 19 speakers. So, you know, we want to first I'm going to talk to Scott and Tree a little bit about their summer back east and what they what do they see in that coast back there that they can't see here on the Atlantic coast. Of course, Scott and Tree are from Maine and uh, came here uh, to share their life with us a few years ago. Well, so about the only thing would be um, Atlantic white sided dolphins. You do. We do have Pacific white-sided here, which I think are actually a little bit prettier than the Atlantic white-sided, and we also have North Atlantic right whales, which you're not going to find in the Pacific. Right, right. <laughs> Somebody really wanders. Um, that's about it. You have humpbacks and finbacks like we have here. Great whites. Bottlenose dolphin, great white sharks, yeah. In fact, that's one of our speakers, is Cindy Weigren, who founded the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, AWSC, yeah. She was a student of mine at University of New Hampshire, one, one of the semesters, and um, then she went off and founded a foundation on the fish, big fish. She kept the size up, but uh, just switched, uh, switched a bit. You know, great, great whites are kind of like Bigfoot. You know, everybody who comes to the ocean, they want to know about great whites. If they're talking about the forest, they all want to know about Bigfoot. Yeah, when they go to Cape Cod now, around where the great white sharks are, they... Um, People standing on the beach hoping to see one. They don't go in the water anymore, but they stand on the beach hoping because they, they do come in very, very close right there. They do. Oh, yeah. Um, Cindy might show some uh, photos of that, I'm hoping, um, of the aerial shots of people standing in ankle deep water and the sharks just 20, 30 yards out. Wow. I don't think they do that as much here. I mean, I don't know that much about great whites. I know we had a down at Salmon Creek in Bodega Bay, if just two or three weeks ago, the surfer got bit. Yeah, we read about that back east. Yeah, but I don't know that they actually come in that closely here. Maybe they do. We just don't know it. Yeah, I was always surprised that um, the abalone divers would have more problems with them being close like this. But you mm -hmm. never heard about it. I have heard about it in Tamales Bay years ago, but um, I haven't, we, we never heard anything about it around here. Yeah, yeah. I, they, somebody recently, uh, I was down in Tamales Bay for uh, some friends, uh, a ceremony down there, a Miwok, coastal Miwok ceremony, and uh, someone was talking about all the aerial photos when they show kayakers out there, <laughs> the great whites <laughs> are just all around, all yeah. over the place out there all the time. And that's what when I think about Tamales Bay all these years, I, I know they're out there. But, you know, yeah, but you don't about, see the fins. Back when I was a student at College of Marin, so not just years ago, it was more decades ago. And uh, I'm not sure at the time that it was recognized, maybe it was, that um, Tamales Bay was a gathering spot for great whites. So um, it's not a place where you'd want to go abalone diving. But yeah. pe people were then. And um, there was that great story that back when I was, well, I thought it was great, back when I was a student. Um, there were two divers in a boat, and one went over the side, began heading down. The other one was still fixing his equipment and heard a noise and turned around. His partner was right up out of the water in the mouth of a great white, Ooh. right next to the boat, which, you know, let him go. And then they decided not to do any more diving. 
the, the and that uh, the one in the mouth was okay he lived to he tell lived, yeah yeah he probably had some bite marks but so i mean that's that's what i mean that's the story i heard down down there but i was you talk about looking like a seal you know if you're snorkeling around mm -hmm. in in shore looking for abalone um right that's what they think you are so yeah i often think about that when i see people throwing you know sticks or balls for their dogs <laughs> far you know way out in tamales yeah. bay and i go oh, no don't do that because <laughs> yeah you know it's just a, they're there they're there they're right. not doing anything wrong uh but but it does happen i've often wondered if they uh maybe on the bottom of surfboards you put big eyes on <laughs> <laughs> that would discourage them. Yeah. They go, oh, look at that big eyed thing. I'm not going there. I don't know. Well, anyway, let's, let's get back though to um, talking about, you know, I, I wanted to mention though, you talked about when you were teaching back East. And so I don't think we've talked so much about your, your uh, teaching experience and what you taught and where. Um, well, overall, I taught everything from, um, I worked with, from everything from, uh, Head Start program when I first moved back east, up to um, different colleges. And uh, a moment ago, I was thinking about when, for some reason, when I was when I taught. Uh, oh, when when you were plugging in music, and I was thinking, you know, if you heard that over, when I was teaching seventh and eighth grade for a couple of years, uh, junior high, it's a fun age, um, thirteen year olds. I was sometimes I, I usually had a small radio i'd bring in and plug in just for myself but with them i would often put on a cl local classical station and have it real low and inevitably they'd start yelling what's that and what's that noise what's that music and i told them it was me humming you know <laughs> i'd say just be quiet it's me humming oh, no. <laughs> you know supposed to calm them down mozart and all that but immediately they start yelling what's that <laughs> <laughs> what is that stuff so that was one level but um yeah, I taught at the University of New Hampshire uh, through continuing education for 14 years, sometimes twice a school year and other times just once. Um, another smaller college up in Portland, Maine, um, Southern, Southern Maine, now they're Southern Maine Community College, they changed their name. And for them, I taught um, ecology with a marine emphasis, um, geology, and um, environmental biology and then it, it was my friend mike williamson we taught an onboard class he was he was teaching at wheelock college and um in boston and we taught an online graduate level course i'm not online on board on the boat um during my whale watch program um for several summers that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. teaching graduate students so that was nice you know, they had a real interest in I bet I bet that's some really good questions. Yeah. And we never really had too much problem with weather because if we had to cancel a trip because of weather. Then we usually go to Mike's basement and show slideshows and, you know, catch up and that type of thing. But we never had really had to do that too often. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, I used to sometimes tell people the difference between um, teaching fifth and sixth graders and college students was just age. I mean, it was size. That was the only difference. <laughs> <laughs> they still get wiggly and, you know, want to know this and that. The, and they all ask good questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I see you get your Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution shirt on. Yeah, That's the, a beautiful shirt. I North know Atlantic that. right Well, The consortium is coming up and the Ropeless um, Consortium is coming up at the same time um, back there. I think it's the same week as our our symposium next week. Mm -hmm. They used to be held in person in New Bedford, which was a whaling capital, which is kind of ironic. But um that was a lot of fun to go to it would be three days and just all day with people giving presentations on right whales and their research and people come from south africa and other places um but with covid so we've been out here since then so uh right. now, it's, now it's all virtual and you still have to pay for it but it's a great conference you know the uh bright whale is that the one most listeners might have some visual of if they think of moby dick that's the sperm whale. That's the sperm whale. Okay. Yeah, I just watched in a hotel the other night. We were driving back here. Um, Nathaniel, the the movie adaptation of Nathaniel Philbrick's book, uh, The Heart of the Sea, which is what a true incident where a, a large right, large white sperm whale, it had enough and went after the whaling ship and sunk it, and um, 
Herman Melville listened to the story from a survivor of that and then um, wrote Moby Dick right there in New Bedford. You know, I think aside from that story of Moby Dick, we don't often think about the whales having yeah. enough of it and, and attacking. Well, I shouldn't say that, that he wrote that in New Bedford. Somebody's probably listening and saying, no, that's not true. He, he uh, lived in Pittsfield, Massachusetts and uh, went back to Pittsfield, I believe, and wrote the story. Across from the Whaling Museum, there's the um, old lodging house where the whalers would would sleep and uh, rent rooms before going out. And if anybody's ever in New Bedford, that um, that uh, whole area is really interesting. A lot of people start Moby Dick and don't finish it, but you know, everybody knows about it. Um, and that's a great tour through there. You can, it's a walking tour through there. You just walk along and get an idea where things are. And they should go in the Whaling Museum too. That's a phenomenal facility. Uh, time to remind you, you're listening to KGUA in Wallala, 88.3 FM, and uh, welcoming back uh, Scott and Tree Mercer from the Mendenoma Whale and Seal Study uh, Organization. And also to remind you, listeners, that you know, we both got mics in our faces here, and drop these down a little bit, but to remind you that next week, starting on Monday, all next week from nine until noon, there is going to be this amazing Ocean Life Symposium. Uh, we'll be hosting it here. It will also be on our KGUA YouTube channel. So you'll get to see presentations by uh, ocean scientists from around the world, really, from and from both coasts. Uh, we mentioned earlier that there'll be a um, woman from the uh, New England presenting about white, uh, great white sharks. Yeah, she's from Cape Cod. Cape Cod. Yeah, and formerly from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. But yeah, Cindy, she's now in you got her center down in Cape Cod. I, I once was, uh, I think it one of the few times when I was up in Connecticut or Maine, I don't remember, but in, in the uh, water. Oh, I know it was up to Chincoteague. I thought in uh, Chincoteague. That's in Virginia, you, you actually. Well <laughs> Is that the place <laughs> with the wild horses? Yeah, yeah. the wild horses. And uh, out in the Atlantic and had never felt such a warm ocean. You know, yeah. I'm used to it here and where you don't get in the ocean and uh, was just enjoying it but being from the bay area i couldn't help but think about the sharks <laughs> that yeah. got out of the water so i imagine they're there too but anyway the symposium is going to be pretty amazing and um you mentioned earlier when i was asking you about your teaching career uh you started learning and being concerned about the ecology of the ocean uh decades ago and now it's really coming to the forefront as global warming climate change mm -hmm. is upon us uh i read two articles before i went on the air i think i sent one to you guys last night about plankton and how that's going to change uh, where plankton lives and what that's going to mean uh for the earth and uh, for the animals in it and um uh, it just, you know, there's so much more that's happening that it made me think, as tiny as plankton are, that when it comes to the climate change and global warming and the ocean, it's the tiny things that are going to make huge differences. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, it's um, <clears throat> I, Americans are not taking climate change seriously. And I don't know what it's going to take or calamities that are coming, calamities that are already here. Um, but they aren't. You know, we were in the, when we were back east, remember, all, I think like through July, um, the fires out here were immense. Uh, there was tremendous heat through the center of the country. And we were getting, un, we were getting um, strange heat back there. Um, and in the morning shows, they were talking about Britney Spears and her conservatorship or something with their, with their father. And come on. Um, you know, the crops are going to be destroyed. We're losing our drinking water. Um, forests take in tremendous amounts of carbon, but they're burning. So carbon is being given off in the, uh, the fire. But when that forest fires burn, this forest burn, now, you, now you've left the soil open to erosion and also to heating. You don't have the trees there anymore with shade and producing oxygen. So it's just this calamity that just keeps unfolding on itself. And now I heard that Biden's probably going to have to drop his clean energy part of his um, infrastructure because Joe Manchin doesn't support it. And I suppose that's because his coal mining in West Virginia, where he's from, 
Hmm. They were always trolling for votes, for votes, you know. So, um, I don't think people are really understanding well, it, well, how serious it is. Two things. I mean, the seriousness of the environmental crisis and letting one person control a presidential yes, minority control, yeah, minority you, control of, of these very important uh, things. And there really is not much more important than climate and, and water. Water, we talked about that uh, briefly the other day on the air with a geologist, uh, Steve Cardamona hmm. uh, uh, from Mendocino College about our water scarcity right here. You know, water, once it's gone, it's gone. I think people just don't get that. And why are they trucking in water from another part of California to another town? The whole state's in a in a severe drought. I mean, how long can that last? Right. Take water from one place and bring it to somewhere else. I don't know. I don't know. But what? But it's who's ever doesn't needs the water the most, I guess. Uh, but you know, the we don't have giant aquifers here, and even if we did, once water when water is gone, there's no other way to put it. When the water is gone, it's gone. Yeah. You know, it doesn't rain the same way every year. We know that. So it's not like it's going to be constantly replenished. And, uh, and, and as the earth gets destroyed more or there's more demands building and water scare areas. Yeah. And here when, when uh, tourists come, they don't think anything about taking a 20, 30 minute shower or, uh, you know, the water scarcity here. They're on vacation. So. Like you said, it's a, Americans are just really not paying attention to what's going on. No, and then when something happens, they'll blame whoever's, you know, whoever's in charge, like it's their fault. Mm -hmm. um, when we get back to the oceans, yeah, the um, uh, plankton is, um, uh, things are adapted to where they live. And as the water's warming up, the Gulf of Maine, for example, um, we've already seen these North Atlantic right whales, the 350 or so that are left, moving up into Canada the last few years. And that was completely unexpected. They normally summer up around the Bay of Fundy in the northern Gulf of Maine. And they, they winter down up in Georgia. At least some others give the cab, have their calves down there. Um, we're not really sure where the mating takes place. We always thought it was in the Bay of Fundy in the fall, but now it doesn't quite look that way. So it's kind of an unknown area it takes place. And the um, reason that the, the um, North Atlantic right whales are moving up into the Bay of um, Gulf of St. Lawrence, I should say, out of the Bay of Fundy um, is because the copepods that they feed on and tremendous amounts of uh, animals in the Gulf of Maine feed on copepods, um, they've moved up into trying to stay with colder water. So the, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 90% of other bodies of water 90 on, on the globe. 90% faster. Yeah. Wow. And that's affecting everything from marshes to um, mm -hmm. the clamming industry. Uh, right now, the lobster industry is furious about um, the closures in areas where right whales travel through and end up entangled in gear at times. And um, they've been working on getting the entire congressional delegation to oppose that. And also, they're going to sue NOAA, North, North Atlantic, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, suing them to, to rescind that because there's a, a big travel way through the Gulf of Maine where they like to lobster and they want the gear out of there when the right whales be going through. So they're suing about that and saying this is all going to destroy their industry. What's going to destroy their industry is, is water warming. You know, mm -hmm. Lobsters prefer cold water. And when, they, uh, when their um, larva goes off, it also needs certain temperatures to develop correctly. And um, they have bigger problems than um, changes in gear. What's going to destroy the industry is climate change. So uh, every time I see a truck, a truck, a pickup truck with traps in the back, and they've got a sticker on for a politician that I know is a climate denier, I just you know slap, slap my head with the palm of my hand. You know, what are you people thinking? Mm -hmm. um, that's not you know. This is your big problem: is the, the changing of the environment. Well, it's all of the above, isn't it? I mean, again, it's that not uh, preparing for what are you going to do when that time comes that you can't fish anymore? Yeah. What are you going to do to feed your family and, uh, you know, pay the bills? And the bills are also going to be changing because of the lack of water or however you heat or whatever you're going to be doing. Everything is going to change. 
Uh, so as you were mentioning the plankton, and that was the article, part of the thing that I read yesterday, I sent to you guys too, about plankton, these tiny organisms that are all going north. They're going to the colder waters. So that means the whole uh, food system in the oceans is going to change. Now, not every life form that feeds off of plankton is going to be able to go north, is it, and live in northern waters? <laughs> no, yeah. because it changes the whole distribution of things. And um, um, Helen Colleen, who is from um, one of our speakers, <clears throat> she's her topic, her, her, her title of her topic is uh, Warming from the Bottom Up. And um, so I think she's going to be talking about climate change. And well, we had another speaker from Humboldt who unfortunately had to had a mm. conflict, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Sarah Ray. And I ran her name through CNBC um, headline on uh, the internet. She put out a book about climate change anxiety. And she'd been working with students at Humboldt about um, controlling their anxiety about their future um, in terms of climate change. And she put a book out about it too. So um, she was very enthusiastic to, to join our, our symposium, but uh, she dropped out. In fact, there were a couple of speakers who um, I got, maybe a little off the subject, but I just want to mention, and uh, I'll mention it next Friday on the wrap up too, but Helen is someone that I contacted back when we were still gonna do this in person at the um, community center down the street here. And I thought we did it last year online here with you guys. And I thought, well, an in-person one, maybe we'd swap every other year or see what was going on. But then I had to cancel that again when it appeared that we we're going to shut down, which we have. Um, so the advantage of doing it this way is I can get speakers in from everywhere. But like I like I told the Anna, or I think I told you on the air during the summer, it's like herding minnows without a net, you know, <laughs> getting a bunch yeah. of speakers from thousands of miles away and trying to keep them corralled and keep them booked. But I had, uh, I went and looking for interesting speakers. It is ocean life. I didn't want to just do whales. Um, I went down through the graduate students at Bodega. I looked up the directory. I was looking for mm -hmm. people with interesting theses they're working on. And um, Helen was one of a couple that I found. She's working on it. She's a PhD candidate. And I contacted her and another student. And one was leaving the country. And one was working on a fellowship or something that's going to be out of the area. And um, right out of the blue, about two months ago, I got an email from Helen telling me that she would be available and um, was working on a presentation to give us. So I, I dropped the news to her that we were now online and I gave her a brief synopsis of how that works. So um, that was wonderful getting her back, getting her, because mm -hmm. you know, I really hoped to get her. And then she told me she wouldn't be able to do it. And uh, then suddenly, boom, I get to see, I had to look up who she was from because I didn't been like four months since I've seen her name. <clears throat> and then another one I wanted to talk, tell you about was Victoria um, Knorr, K-N-O-R-R. -R. Um, oh, when Sarah Ray dropped out, we had an hour to fill. And I asked a few people and I didn't get answers back. They didn't answer, you wouldn't believe how many people don't reply to emails <laughs> until you do something like this. Right. Or some people, you know, sent regrets. But um, we had this hour and I was racking my brain who I was going to get. We were driving through Nevada and um, we had actually had uh, Wi-Fi driving on Route 80 through the mountains of Nevada. And um, I looked at my email and I had a request for someone to join my LinkedIn. And I didn't even know I had a LinkedIn anymore. I mean, I never look at it. <laughs> I had to change the password because I, didn't, I had no idea what that was. Right. When it was Victoria Knorr who had found me on LinkedIn and wanted to be one of my whatever you call on their contacts or something. She asked me to, to want to connect with you. Yeah. yeah. So um, I looked and she said Washington state and she's working with the Dungeness crab um, to um, reduce the risk of entanglement with whales. I couldn't believe it. I was looking at about something just falling in your lap. So I, it took me about three hours to get an email for her going through Google and finally got an email and I invited her to be a speaker and she immediately got back to me. Two states later, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think we got all the way to Winnemucca by the time I finally. But yeah, I mean, there's another one just just fell out of the sky. You know? Well, this, this is great. Well, if you just joined us, I'm talking with Scott Mercer of Mendonoma Whale and Seal Study. And we're very excited because starting next Monday, 
It has been in the process for quite a while. It's the third annual Ocean Life Symposium. And um, the last year, and of course this year too, because of COVID, uh, it affected having the uh, symposium, having it live. The first year it was right here in Guilala at the community center. And Mendocino. Mendocino, I'm sorry, yeah. Mendocino. And you had many uh, great uh, ocean life experts. But this year, it is one of the advantages of using uh, social media and Zoom that w that Scott and Tree uh, have been able to pull together a lot of guests as uh, speakers uh, and phenomenal guest speakers when we did our run through the other day. And I was looking at everybody on the screen uh, that you, you, as viewers and listeners, you're not going to see all 19 of them at once, uh, but it was quite an impressive scene. There were about 16 of them and uh, these men and women in different parts of the world, literally, and in different uh, fields, including uh, Mr. Chami from the International Monetary Fund. Oh, yeah, Ralph Chami, yeah. Ralph Chami from the International Monetary the Fund. guy he is. I'm yeah. And to his talk. Why, and you'll find out why he was included. Uh, with this, but uh, it's just a, a group of people who are studying so many things, but the most important thing is two things. I mean, what you will learn about life in the ocean on whatever coast or ocean that that person might be studying, but also to think about right now, right now, and what climate change means. And these are people who are studying the reality of it. Um, Tree will be on in in a in a while to talk to us about uh, the mortality event that's that's happening out in the ocean. I was talking with a station manager from Hoopa, and uh, he said we didn't used to hear about all of these whales being washed up on the shore, did we? And I said I don't, you know, it's something to ask the experts. I don't know if this amount, and you know, Tree, you can probably address that later as to whether or not this has become this has become a regular phenomenon. Yeah, I, I I firmly believe that it's due to um. I, mean, I don't have any reputation to worry about, so um. There, I know there are people who stopped just short of saying you know they'll say it's probably climate change. I think it's climate change. The whales are starving. Yeah, they're thin. They're, they're walking very thin. emaciated and uh, mm -hmm. uh, probably losing calves. Well, they would not probably they would be losing their calves on account of this. Uh, they're either not getting pregnant or they're losing the calf before it goes full term because the mother's not healthy. She's going to lose the the fetus. Um, otherwise, they both die. And it's to nature, you know, evolution is more important. Natural selection is more important for the mother to stay alive and possibly have another calf, keep things rolling. Um, but, um, and also, you know, they're seeing less calves down in the lagoons than they did before. And they're seeing skinny whales down there. Now, how are they going to make it back up to the Bering Sea if they're looking emaciated down there? And, you know, we're getting these whales washing in. and we don't know how many are washing in because um, gray whales, when they're, especially when they're emaciated and their blubber layer is thin, uh, tend to sink, mm -hmm. and sink quickly. And, you know, going, as long going along the coast, there's lots of places for whales to wash in and never be seen. So we don't know how many there are. I mean, you know, the, the figure you've heard of like 10 times um, what we know, you know, it's eight to 10 times easily mm. of what we see. So, so Scott, if I'm sitting in... Um... Salina, Kansas, or Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Why should I care? Why should well, I care about the whales? They need to listen next week, and Ralph Chompy will tell them exactly why they should care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and it could be the same thing could be said about elephants, mm -hmm. you know, or giraffes. Yeah, I actually, um, I shouldn't get into this. I was only sitting there watching, but you know, Zach Cliver, you've met him in my house. And, mm -hmm. um, he's working on ropeless gear, right? They're testing it with, with the lobster people out off of Kennebunk, Maine, and he was staying at our house because he's stationed up there, lives up in Bar Harbor. And um, <clears throat> he was, he's actually the contact we got for Ralph Chami. He introduced me to Ralph. And um, Ralph had a, Ralph, we were sitting in on a Zoom conference that Ralph was having with three or four colleagues around the world. And they had a program called Vulcan that um, had these remote cameras. <clears throat> And they were keeping track of elephants. And they had, there was somebody in, in Africa and Ralph was in Washington, DC. And Zach and I were in Maine and there were two or three other people around the world. 
And we're watching this on the screen and you can see these elephants moving, you know, and they were being moving through the jungle and looking for water holes and so forth. So um, yeah, it's concern about uh, all these large terrestrial mammals and um, the environments they live in, which are being so altered. But that was a fascinating program called Vulcan. Hmm. That would be very interesting. Well, I, you know, it, it's kind of like there's eyes on all of us as humans, too. I mean, how are they, you know, how people yeah. are faring, whether they're in California, New York, Thailand, you know, uh, Nova Scotia. And next week we have Ra a Rich Rials coming on. He lives in Washington State, and he's the one who developed the ropeless gear that, um, which we hope is going to work here. And so we have um, uh, Victoria. And Jack Barkowski, who works with the science of entanglements and identifying whales have been tang entangled by the scars and scrapes, which may sound easy, but it's not. Uh, Jack is a student, a grad student at Moss Landing Marine Lab, and he and Tree and I become quite friendly in a virtual sort of way. Um, we sat through a lot of his, um, we, we put together a, an audience for him once to, to talk about this here last winter. And um, we Noyo's had him on and a couple of others since then. Um, Jack is going to be one. Of, so we have uh, Victoria and Jack and Rich Rials, who actually developed the um, robust gear and how it works. So we have quite a bit on the entanglements, which I'm really excited about having Victoria drop in out of nowhere last week. Um, and she's working actually working with the Dungeonese crab. Because hmm. like, uh, most of the emphasis has been with the main lobster. And well, well, that I know of, um, people that I'm really in contact with. So now having somebody who's actually working with the, she and her team are working with Dungeonese crab and trying to mitigate the um, entanglement issues with marine mammals. Uh, you're listening to Scott Mercer of Mendocino Whale and Seal Study. And, you know, you've mentioned the ropeless gear several times now. Mm -hmm. And for people who might not, are not familiar with this, and we have people people here, as you mentioned, the Dungeness, of course, we all love the Dungeness and in the Atlantic uh, lobster, and they, you know, people like to eat those, um, uh, but they come at a cost. And part of the cost, uh, yes, I mean, aside from fishing, is to the whales. So when you talk about ropeless gear, what are you talking about? And how does that relate to these two? Well, if you reduce the vertical lines in the water, <clears throat> then you reduce the risk of um, animals swimming into getting tangled up. Whales tend to collide with the line and they're not used to that. You know, the ocean is a big, wide spatial area that they've lived in for many millions of years. And if they bump into something or they're moving along, their flippers are out, they tend to immediately roll to get away from it. And when they roll, they bring the rope along with their flipper and then it rolls around them. In one of our presentations we did at the lighthouse, we have a computer graphic of that, of a right whale. Um, which has been put together with the scarring and the gear that um, they've been working with for years now. To, um, but what, what happens when these whales get tangled up, how they get in the, in the mess they end up in um, when they run into gear. So uh, if you re reduce the vertical lines, the obstacles to the whales, then um, you're going to reduce the number of entanglements. In Maine, they wanted to reduce 50%, a reduction of 50% of the vertical lines. And um, actually, this this gear could actually save um, parts of the fishing industry. They can reduce hitting these endangered species. So even though they're opposed to changing their ways of harvesting crabs and, and lobsters, um, this could actually you know, save the industry in the long run hmm. from these endangered species. Or when these whales get caught up in lines, it's uh, used to be thought, well, they're so big, they can break through anything, but they don't, and they die a horrible death. Sometimes it takes them six months to nine months to die. Um, they can't eat. Um, we've seen cases where they've um, had their flippers cut off. The rope just cuts through, right, right through the bone and amputates uh, flippers, the tail flukes so they can't swim cor correctly. The tail flukes are their low motion, locomotion. Um, there was a case in New England, uh, a couple of years ago, the whale continuously and then um, and uh, Scott Landry from uh, Provincetown has been now the chief person to go to when um, and his team when whales get caught up in the Gulf of Maine, and he had disentangled this female young female humpback several times, and then 
she did wash up dead. She, just one of those whales that kept running into gear. And um, they found the rope had cut through her skull and up into oh. the brain case. And uh, amazingly, she did have food in her stomach when they did the necropsy. Not much, but it was a horrible death. And it's the same as when they get hit with ships too. The, the um, collisions are the same. We saw a slide the other night um, of a whale that was all hemorrhaged when they opened it up. The whale had died and washed up. But that meant that it stayed alive after the you know, big ship had hit it and had all this massive internal bleeding. So they, it's a agonizing, a long agonizing death for the animals. It is a horrible images to think about. And, and I have seen some of your presentations and, and, and understand, uh, you know, have seen what you're, the consequences of what you're talking about. And again, I think for people who don't live anywhere near an ocean, who they don't think about whales or you know any life forms maybe they don't even eat crab or lobster they just don't have any understanding of you know why why should we care yeah well ted cheeseman is one of our speakers um he does happy whale which is the the archiving and identification of individual humpbacks and now he's moving into gray whales and i've actually known ted since he was eight i've known his family <laughs> since he was eight wow. years old and um uh, yeah ted actually credits me with um, he's told other people I've, that I've actually shown him his first breaching humpback when he was eight years old. Um, but uh, as Ted said, um, the whales are kind of out of sight, like you've been alluding to, and that if we saw animals entangled in roadside fences, we get out of the car and try to help them, which you see pictures of all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we wouldn't stand for it. But you know, people can't see the whales at twenty or thirty miles out. One of the saddest photos I saw was. Um, uh, we used as an image at the um, climate change symposium that um, let's see, uh, Pat and um, well, the Chabon's put on. Uh, Chabon's, I don't the name. Chabon. Chabon, yeah. Yeah. Joel, all right, sorry, Joel, he's having a, a mental, mental freeze there. Um, <laughs> I almost called him Jake. <laughs> yeah, Joel and Pat uh, put on, and uh, Patrick from the uh, Aravadas. Mm hmm. Um, and I spoke at that, and Jeannie Jackson and uh, several others, Richard Charter spoke at it. And uh, there was a whale, a humpback whale that had, I don't know, I'm sorry, great, uh, no, um, right whale that had swam through the Gulf of Maine up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence looking for copepods and got caught up in crab gear and swam like a thousand miles down to Cape Cod where the, um, it was disentangled finally by Scott Landry's team off of Provincetown. But the baleen in whales hangs down vertically. And right whales have very long baleen. And in this photograph, they were, the whale had his head up trying to breathe off of, right outside of Provincetown Harbor. And the baleen was sticking straight out of its mouth with the rope had pulled it right out. So mm. it was sticking straight out. And they said later that the baleen did finally go back in and I believe the whale did survive eventually. But it swam 1,300 miles with rope through its mouth, wrapped around its lower jaw, around its head, as it rolled and tried to get out of this gear that it was in, and just pull that baleen right straight out. Uh, well, you know, we have seen uh, in recent years more whales coming to humans, who if they're yeah. trapped in ropes and coming to humans for help. So is this a learned behavior now that there are people that are out trying well, to was, save it them? It was odd that this whale ended up in Provincetown where the best, uh, the best disentanglers live. Um, <laughs> the word is out. Yeah. The word is out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There, there are disentanglement teams up the coast, but it's funny they came, you know, ended yeah. up there. Um, at the time I thought, boy, that's serendipitous, I guess, uh, coincidental. But yeah. Um, but we see more and more whale and human encounters, not always on the negative yeah. side, you know, uh, but uh, that's, it, it just seems whether it's coincident or some kind of learned behavior that they know some humans will help them. Yeah. Um, so people listening, um, if you've come across an entangled whale uh, out in the water, you need to call the Coast Guard right away and they'll get a dang kill. New Brunswick, just over the main water. It was a, he was a fisherman himself. He was trained in the States. 
uh, Native and Acadian, and uh, he had successfully disentangled them. And um, these are wild animals. They don't know you're there to help them. And right. they don't always know when they're disentangled. Well, the whale figured out it was disentangled and um, it was free and took a, a real steep dive next to the boat, flipped its tail up and caught him in the head and killed him, killed Joe. So uh, it was very dangerous. They are. They're huge. I, you know, I'm looking at your shirt again with this mm -hmm. right, white whale and the uh, mouth is different than I'm used to seeing on photos in, of whales out here. Yeah, right whales have very large um large mouths, they open up and they filter feed plankton, which are the copepods. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're moving up into Canada um, after the copepods. I brought home a piece of um, bowhead baleen that I've had in my barn in Maine. I keep forgetting to bring it out here this year. I remember to bring it out. I had it next to my head all the way because it's 10 feet long. And <laughs> we put it through the back of the Odyssey and it right up to the very front. So I had it hanging down next to my face so 3,200 miles, but I finally got it out here. The bowhead whales have baleen that's extremely long and they feed like right whales do with their mouths wide open. And they're called bowheads because there's the bow, the top jaw is really bowed to accommodate this baleen that's 10 to 12 feet long in the back. And right whales have baleen that's eight or nine feet long. Mm. Very fragile because they don't slam into schools of fish. They go along very peacefully, with their mouth open, um, skimming. Tons of. Yeah. Cocoa Pops. Little Cocoa Pops, you know. Hey, wow. School kids call them. Well, I, I, we're going to switch and talk to Tree in just a minute here, but Scott and Tree, um, we're just so grateful that you guys have, you know, joined us here at KGUA over the years and are now bringing us this third annual Ocean Life Symposium. Uh, I personally learned so much, you know, I, of uh, about the ocean and the ocean life and it's just fascinating, and it's so important for us, I think, as humans to understand all life. I mean, it's a term Native people use all the time. All life is sacred, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so, but what does that really mean? Things that we don't get to see and uh, that, that we learn uh, about from you guys. So this Ocean Life Symposium starts next Monday, 9 to noon. Uh, wonderful scientists looking at all kinds of different aspects of the ocean life and uh, what's happening now. And I just think it's phenomenal. And I hope other stations will be uh, using it. We'll also be using our uh, KGA YouTube channel, which we happen to think is pretty innovative for doing radio with pictures these days. We've done that a lot and allow the listeners, you to see some of these presentations by these Many world famous scientists, you know, it's just phenomenal. Thank you for that. Well, thanks for supporting it the way you have. You know, we couldn't have done it the last two years at all um, without the station. And uh, we're already planning next year differently, a different way of doing it with the station. Um, you know, we kind of have a little format we're working out with it, maybe a, of a um, extreme topics type of thing, you know, topics that are really important. There was, it was time for Tree, but there was one woman who wanted to do this and um, she would have been a great one for you to, she'd still be a great one for you to interview. She's a, a professor at Colby College in Maine. And um, her, what she's studying is the island nations, independent island nations that are losing their land because mm -hmm. of, and she had these um, horrible, I mean, it's just horrible images, videos of um, these islands being washed over and people losing their crops, their livestock, you know, it's happening right now. So the people in Kansas may not recognize this, you know, there's a problem for them, but uh, these the independent island nations don't have the resources to protect themselves. You have the money to um, fight this right now and, and relocation's an issue. You know, where are they gonna go? I mean, there is land right now with people on it and livestock and crops that's being flooded mm -hmm. on a daily basis. You know, and it's quickening as, as the oceans warm up. I think I just saw a graphic, not of that exact thing, but yeah. of the rise yeah. that is happening now to the earth and to any place that has, There's you know, surrounded by water, it's changed. Dr. Stacy Robinson, and she um, sent her regrets twice. She really wanted to be involved in this, but it was right during her teaching time at Colby, which went right into her office hours with students. And she said she'd be on um, sabbatical next year. Good. She's, she's already let me know she wants to be involved next year. And I sent her the stuff that um, you you and Leanne have been putting out you know, well, to show that this is real and we actually do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, KGA will continue to cover the environment. So come on over, Ms. Tree. Thank you, Scott, as always. Well, and you, uh, 
so so many speakers next week we didn't even give you the list but you can look uh at kgua.org online and uh go to our facebook page uh any number of places uh you know uh, uh the locally the ico newspaper we have information just about everywhere let me fix your mic too we can see you a bit better and um all right so now the other half of this dynamic team <laughs> tree mercer back from maine and uh so tree uh, you know and i was listening to a, as i'm talking and i'm listening to a story i think oh my god we're talking about horrible things but you know that's the reality of uh, learning about climate change in the world and it's not all bad but then again now we're going to talk about some more tragedies in the ocean i'm afraid so yeah and and why is it important to know this uh, just because um you know we're all affected we're all connected all life forms are truly connected and we depend on each other in in many different ways um the there is a a, a group out of colorado called the inland uh, ocean coalition and they <laughs> do care deeply about the ocean and they i i am on their their uh, mailing list and i read their newsletters so there are some people in those landlocked states that are aware that the oceans are are suffering that they're in trouble and uh they have fundraising events and all sorts of things you know to try to support positive changes in the ocean that's great you know and and, and i didn't you know, not picking on, uh, I just pulled two towns uh, mm -hmm. names out, but you know, at the same time, we don't know a, a lot of us, unless we live in the desert, what's going on in the desert. If we did, lived in the mountains, we would know more about the mountains. Mm -hmm. Just happens that right here at KGUA in Wallala that you're listening to, we look out at the Pacific Ocean. We drive up and down the Pacific Ocean all the time. We see the whales occasionally, and every time we see a whale, a fin or a a, a back or a head mm -hmm. or just a spout mm -hmm. we just it's thrilling it is it's absolutely i can't tell you folks it's just the most thrilling thing to see part just a part of this huge creature that's mm -hmm. out there so that's one of the reasons that we focus here on not only the ocean but on on all life and on sustainability mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. that's one of the roles of the station but I digress okay. let's hear um uh, Tree, tell people what it is that you've been keeping track of. Yes, I've been uh, always each month I get an update from NOAA on the unusual mortality event that was declared in 2019 for the gray whales. It is still active and open, which means that uh, there are teams in, of scientists and researchers who are still trying to determine what is causing these uh, this unusually high number of deaths that we have seen since 2019. I will say there is a little good news that the trend from 2019 till today, it's we are seeing less each year, less deaths. Mm. So hopefully um, it will continue in this trend and that the and not only continue in it but that the uh, gray whales will rebound a bit in their population their population has um, been reduced by almost 25 uh, percent mm. from a high of approximately twenty-seven thousand in 2016 to this year the estimate population was only twenty thousand. that's a pretty significant decline Although NOAA's experts say it, 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 they're, they're very confident that this is something that the gray whales will be able to rebound from. Uh, it, it's, they're saying it's more of an, a natural occurrence that populations do reach highs and lows. That was going to be my next question mm -hmm. if this was cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. The last uh, uh, UME for the gray whales was 99 to 2000. No cause was ever determined uh, as to what caused that. And it was similar in its impact to this year's. And they did. The gray whales did a rebound quite, quite nicely from that. So we're, we're hoping, you know, for that. Here are the, the latest okay. statistics. As of October 1st, Alaska had 22 uh, strandings of dead gray whales. Washington State, eight. 
Oregon had three and California 19. 19. Yeah. A lot of them were in the San Francisco Bay Area earlier this year. Many of them within a two week period, I believe seven to eight gray whales stranded Mm. various uh, areas of the bay. So that represents uh, 52 deaths in the United States by um, country, Canada, three, the United States, 52, Mexico, 54. So we've had 109 gray whale deaths this year in 2021. Now compare that to 2019 when we had 216 deaths, 2020, 172. And this year with the 109. So in the last three years, we have seen 497 dead gray whales, which represents maybe only 10% of whales that have actually died. Most of the carcasses do not wash ashore. That's an estimate. There's a range of some say three to 13% higher than Mm -hmm. what we see. So, I mean, that could be approximately 5,000 gray whales have died in the last three years. Many of them are malnourished. They are not getting enough food to fuel that long migration, especially northward back to their feeding grounds in the uh, Arctic which is supposed to be rich in in what they eat, but maybe it's no longer has enough food to support them. So, and and do we have any idea of the ages of these whales? That's a very good question, Peggy. It it does vary. Some are quite young. They're immature or Mm -hmm. adolescent, sub-adult, if you will, and and others are adult. There, There doesn't seem to be any consistency, any pattern. It kind of ranges over all ages of the whales. And, and, but a lot of it does seem to be the lack of food. Yes. Well, and as you know, Scott and I were talking about that article I sent to you about plankton, yeah. you know, that doesn't bode well at all. No, it doesn't. That is the basis of the ocean food web, you know, you know like plants are on, on terrestrial mm-hmm. food webs. It, it is so vitally important to, to all life in the ocean. Now, that really had me concerned as I read that, you know, last night. And it's, it, I don't know if migration was the right word. word. Most of these zooplankton are drifters, right. you know, they, they, they're drifting. So what it means is that the colder environment is favoring the, the, them. So there, there appears to be greater numbers of them in those cold, cooler temperature. They're not surviving where the weather is, uh, you know, the temperature is getting higher. So see. I wonder how they fl- float into the currents that are going to take them yeah. northern. I mean, how do they know that? Yes, I, I'm not sure that they do. It's more like the environment it selects those that that are that survive mm-hmm. in the cooler and it's not it's um it, it's not selecting them to survive in those warmer tropical waters mm-hmm. you see yeah you yeah know. it's fascinating mm-hmm. and, you know again this tiny thing that's going to make a major difference and and we won't even know the results of a lot of that because so much of this is unknown and new yeah thanks to you guys you know get pulling these uh seminars and Mm -hmm. symposium together we're all learning a lot together and stimulating uh other people to study a lot of these um events which is just is is wonderful i noticed uh, somebody posted on facebook i think it was last night they saw uh, a couple of spouts, and I think they were going north. Mm-hmm. And so somebody said, oh, is it an early migration? Is it? <laughs> it's no, not that time of year. No, it's not. It's not at all. Um, and the some, some uh, we've seen humpbacks. I'd like to tell you about our day yesterday at oh, the great. lighthouse. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're just following food for right now. Uh, but the migrate, the gray whale migration uh, has not really begun yet. Uh, it, it occurs maybe end of November into December. Uh, and that's when we'll see. Uh, I was going to go over the order in which we'll see them. The, the 
Go okay. for it. Go for the, it. Just, the, we've got about five minutes. Okay, great. So when we do, when the uh, South migration occurs, um, the near-term pregnant females will be the first to pass through our area. They want to get to the warm, calm uh, lagoons in, um, in Baja, Mexico to give birth. But many of them uh, give birth it, when they hit Southern California on the way down. They don't quite make it into the lagoons, so they will give birth down there. They are followed by adult males and females who are heading to the lagoons for mating purposes, you see. So um, that, that should be coming up. Hopefully, uh, we'll start seeing that, as I said, may, maybe the end of November, but more so into December. The height of that south ground, southbound migration occurs mid-January, right here in our area. We have eight years of data to show that that's our highest counts always in, in mid-January. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about that. And then uh, northbound, the leaders will be the adult females that presumably, presumably have just conceived down in the lagoons. They are, of course, are very anxious to return to their feeding grounds to get no nourishment for themselves and their fetus. So uh, that that's uh, the first ones we'll see coming back. They can come back as early as um, mid-February. Wow. Uh, sometimes we have them uh, passing by. The end of the southbound migrators are passing the early northbound migrators. So we'll look for that. Then the adult males uh, come back, females maybe that did not be, uh, successfully conceive. And then the immatures will also kind of follow that. The last to return are the lactating females. They stay in the lagoons an average of 32 days uh, to make sure to feed their calf and to get the calf strong enough to make that long migration back. How long is a gestation period? Uh, almost a year. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yep, is they, they conceive one year and then they, they won't give birth to the following year, about 12 months. You yeah. know, I was wondering, and we're, we're running out of time already, uh, when the females that come down and give birth either in, you know, Southern California or the bays in Mexico, are they protected by other adults? I mean, thinking how easily their babies could be prey. Uh, or is there some sort of uh, familial protection or the, anything? There is not, no. Although sometimes we'll see, we have this beautiful footage, I think taken in um, Monterey with three mother gray whales swimming together and each one had a calf, you know, three of them together. Uh, but they, it's not, they are not known for any type of, um, you know, group or, you know, protection like that. They're kind of on their own. These, uh, yeah, these whales more or less uh, solitary in their movements and yeah, their migration. Well, it's interesting because the predators are definitely packed animals and they are busy hunting like wolves yeah. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, we're just about out of time. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, no, it's you fine. Know, yeah, it's so great to have you guys back. And for great you guys coming here originally to just, you know, start educating us, you and Tree, uh, Tree <laughs> you and Scott, along with Leanne uh, and various hosts, myself, George Callis, Paul Monday, will all be here every day next week and bringing you three hours, listeners, about ocean life, Atlantic coast, West coast, other parts of the ocean. And uh, we can't wait to bring you that. We're going to suspend our regular programming. No, no KGA writers, by the way, on Monday, none of that either. Right. So just be aware. Uh, ocean life, you know, we all believe all life is sacred. We've all got yes. something we can do about it. And so we're going to learn about it next week. So is there one, uh, shoot, I'm out of time. That's I'm okay. out of time. That's fine. All right. Thank you guys. Thank and this you, will Peggy. repeat at one o'clock. Oh, I didn't even get to the announcements. I just went straight into everything.